so that's why I stick with UTC and uh, which is actually good for us because uh, when they schedule contacts uh, it's during their working hours and their working hours are uh, the same hours as we are awake uh, while for other continents it's uh, in the evening or in the morning early and that's more difficult uh, so a couple of uh, minutes left Hello, my name is Werven with a new live of YouTube Okay, so welcome to the audience on YouTube. Uh, and uh, in a few moments, we will start the show. So, Nog even een reminder aan iedereen, aan iedereen, als we zelfs applaudisseren voor Chris Cassidy, uh, vergeet dan niet te unmuten, want in de voorbije oefensessies um, was dat al uh, een keer het geval. Dus niet vergeten te unmuten zelfs bij het applaus. Oké, okay, so... Um, couple of minutes left. Maybe we can show the audience uh, the current location of the ISS now. Nick, can you uh, make that happen? Okay, so that's for the students. So ISS just crossed the uh, touched uh, Australia uh, and it will fly over the uh, Pacific Ocean and reach the Gorn station where we will perform the contact. We have about half an hour to go, 40 minutes to be precise, before the signal is, can be acquired. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Welcome for today. Uh, today we will hopefully realize a contact between students in Hart, Belgium, from the Don Bosco School, and Chris Cassidy on board of the ISS. The students will uh, contact the uh, and be able to ask questions, and Chris will answer them, hopefully. So, uh, back to the uh, introduction. I will present a small introduction so that everybody understands what is involved with such a contact. So here you have a picture of the ISS. Uh, there are other pictures, and it's not the latest status, but it is a very good view of it. It all started a couple of years ago, on October 4th, 1957, when the Russian launched Sputnik. That was the first artificial satellite put into orbit and radio amateurs across the world uh, received the signals of the satellite, uh, of the first ever man-made satellite. This satellite lasted a couple of weeks. Uh, it was only battery powered, so uh, it didn't have a lot of power on board. Radio amateurs uh, are active over 100 years and they're interested in experimenting and studying radio waves. This, of course, includes space-based communications. 
So in 1961, they built and launched their first satellite. They called it OSCAR, Orbiting Satellite Carrying Amateur Radio. OSCAR looks like a box uh, like this on the picture. And it was launched on the December 12th, 1961. And it was put on an orbit of about 245 kilometers. It weighed four and a half kilos and it lasted three weeks because the batteries didn't last longer. The actual satellite re-entered a couple of years later in the atmosphere and burnt in the upper layers. For 570 radio amateurs in the world in 28 different countries could receive the signal. So it was quite uh, active for our first satellite. You will ask, but who are the radio amateurs? Radio amateurs like me, you will find them all around the globe and also in all social groups. They have one thing in common, it's their passion for radio. Uh, below you can see a small picture of uh, Juan Carlos, King of Spain. Uh, he is also an active radio amateur. Two well-known radio amateurs here have been in space. Uh, the two Belgian astronauts, Dirk Frimurt, has been, in, has been in space in 1902 on board of the space shuttle. And Frank de Winne was also in space twice in 2002 and in 2009 when he was there for six months and also achieved to be the uh, commander of the ISS for three months. To become licensed radio amateur, you have to pass an exam at the BIPT, the Belgian Institute for Post and Telecommunications. It's an exam that proves that you have some basic knowledge of the technology, of the radio technique, and also that you know all the regulations about it. And you must be at least 12 years old. Radio amateurs have built since 1961 over 100 satellites. Some are in space, like Oscar 7, since over 40 years and still operational. UFTI 1 was a satellite built by the University of Liège and launched in 2016, so it's a pure Belgium satellite. Currently, they are working on UFTI-2, which is the, uh, also built in collaboration with students from the Athenaeum of JET. So there are about a couple of kids, 16, 17 years old, actually building equipment which will fly into space. One common question is why does a satellite stay in space? It should fall down. So why doesn't it do? So we can imagine an experiment. We just build a cannon on a very high mountain and shoot a satellite or a ball. And you will see that the ball falls down to, towards Earth. If you shoot it with a stronger speed, it will fall further away. If you shoot it at about 7.9 meters per second, it will actually fall just next to the Earth and miss the Earth and continue falling, 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 and actually orbit around the Earth. So the minimum speed you need is 7.9 meters per sec kilometers per second. Uh, if you shoot it with a stronger speed, it will fall further away, so it will orbit in a larger orbit around the Earth. Finally, if you shoot it with above 11.3 kilometers per second, 
it will actually leave the uh, orbit of Earth and fly into deep space. So these are some principles uh, which were discovered already by Kepler in the medieval times and which are still valid today. The ISS is a satellite positioned around 420 kilometers of altitude. Uh, the exact altitude currently is 421.7 kilometers above Earth. And it takes 92 minutes to fly once around the Earth. So it flies at seven, about 7.9 kilometers per second, which is 28,000 kilometers an hour. Satellites have different kind of orbits. When you fly around the equator, uh, it's or it's an easy orbit, but you will see only part of the Earth. You will just see uh, 2,000 kilometers above north and south of the equator, and that's all. More interesting for Earth ob observation is the polar orbit. In this case, the satellites fly over the south and the north pole of the Earth, and as the Earth rotates below, you will have a view of the whole Earth in several orbits, but you can have all the uh, observe for weather or other resources, you will have a good view of the Earth. ISS flies in an orbit which is inclined with 51 degrees of uh, inclination, so that it will no, not go beyond 51 degrees north, or 51 degrees south. So it will see pretty much of the Earth. It will see uh, Northern Europe, uh, except the tip of uh, Scandinavia. It will see also uh, Africa, most parts of Asia, except uh, the Northern Siberia. And also it will see <coughs> Uh, the United States and South America, except the northern part of Canada. So it will cover almost all the of the Earth. Uh, the reason for that is that the ISS is below the Van Allen belt. The Van Allen belt is a part of the higher atmosphere where the all the ionic particles <coughs> from the solar wind are trapped and form a shield, uh, a radiation shield for the Earth. So uh, without it, the radiation on the Earth would be much stronger. <coughs> this Van Allen belt has a gap uh, above the poles. And so if the ISS would fly into it, it would be exposed to very severe uh, radiation coming from the sun and from uh, ionic particles of solar winds. <coughs> when the ISS is above us, it can see a circle of visibility. This is the horizon of the ISS. It's a circle which has about uh, 2 uh, 2,700 kilometers of radius. So that's what you can see from the ISS. When the ground station tries to contact the ISS, it has to be in view of the satellite of the ISS. So it can only contact it if ISS sees the ground station and if the ground stations can see the ISS. The time it takes for the ISS to pass one ground station is at least at maximum 10 minutes. Uh, um, remember it flies with 28,000 kilometers an hour. So it is very fast. And so a contact can only last 10 minutes. That would be uh, 
the case if the ISS would fly over uh, Belgium, where this little black cross is, uh, it takes 10 minutes to fly over. Don Bosco had already planned a contact, uh, direct contact, uh, which was scheduled last uh, in December. It couldn't go on, but everything was ready uh, for it. So they built antennas, antenna rotator, and the control box for it uh, at the school. And this equipment is still waiting for another contact, potentially. So everything was built uh, by the students and in a very robust and industrial manner. Uh, duplicate to have uh, redundancy, so if one fails, the other can take over. So that is the control software to track the antennas when the ISS is flying over the ground station. <clears throat> What we will do is we will make a telebridge contact. Uh, currently, the satellite is not above our heads, and uh, all the students are confined at home. The school is closed. So what we'll do is we have found a ground station in New Hampshire, in the USA, uh, that will do the contact for us, and we are all connected to this ground station via internet. The ISS is a, uh, the International Space Station is a very big uh, satellite. It was launched starting 1998, and it was actually launched module by module and assembled in space. So the, it grows continuously, so the current picture is no, not the latest one, but it's almost the latest one. The, the size of the ISS is like a football field. It's 72 meters wide, 108 meters long, and uh, 20 meters thick. Of course, most of it are the solar panels, but it's a very big, big satellite. It weighs about 450 tons, 450,000 kilograms. We achieved to put two radio matter station on board, uh, one in the Russian module and one in the Galileo module from ESA. The first radio matter contact was done in 2000. And since we did more than 1300 school contacts, we have also provision to send SSTV signals. So that are pictures and package radio, that is uh, data. The ISS is an assembly of different modules from different countries. Russia has the Svezda and Zaria modules. USI provided Unity, Tranquility, and Destiny. Uh, ESA has provided the Columbus module. Uh, Kibo comes from Japan. And there's also the arm uh, from Canada, which is used to manipulate uh, experiments and loads outside of the ISS. The station we will use is in the Russian service module. Uh, so it's one of the stations. And uh, the actual antennas are just clipped outside of the uh, module on some handrails. So it can be very easily replaced or moved. Of course, inside the ISS, it sometimes looks very crowded because they don't have much space. They have a lot of experiments, a lot of equipment. And so it looks very crowded. Here you will see a picture of Thomas Pesquet, which was there about one year ago.
ARIS, Amateur Radio on International Space Station, is a group that operates also 12 ground stations around the world. There are a few in Europe, in Belgium and Italy. There are some in the United States, like the one which we use today. There are two in Argentina, three in Australia, and one in South Africa. So these stations can be used uh, to establish school contacts and allow schools to talk to astronauts. Today, we will use the ground station in New Hampshire, United States. It's located a bit north of New York, and it's operated by Fred AB1OC. A quick look in the station, you will see on the screen the position of the ISS and the controlling of the uh, antenna position that is done by the PC. Next to it, you will find the transmitter, which allows to actually uh, send the radio signal and receive the signal from the ISS. And on the right side, you will find the uh, controller for the antenna's position and also other uh, device for speech processing. The antenna from AB1OC are outside and they are steerable so that you can turn them and tilt them to track the satellite. The contact will be established when the ISS comes over the area which can be seen by the ground station. And so this is due to be about 1052 UTC, which is 1252 local Belgium time. And the contact will last nine minutes and 42 seconds. The students are in, at their home in Belgium and they will contact the uh, ground station AB1OC through internet. And the ground station will relay the audio over the radio waves towards ISS and the same, the downlink from ISS will be received by the uh, ground station and put on the internet so the students can hear it. The astronaut we are, will be talking today is Chris Cassidy. Chris Cassidy is a US astronaut it's the third time he has been in space on board of ISS, and he's currently the commander. Uh, he's born in 1917. Uh, he's married and has five children. Uh, the other astronauts on board, there are two American astronauts which are part of the SpaceX mission, and there are two Russian cosmonauts which are also on board. So currently they are, have a crew of five people. One of the concerns of ISS is space debris. If you look in the space, you will find that there are a huge amount of numbers uh, of objects flying around. Uh, there are more than 5,400 objects which are larger than one meter. 34,000 objects and more are between 10 centimeters and one meter. There are 900,000 objects which are between one and 10 centimeters and more than 1.3 million objects which are just one to 10 millimeters or wide and much more which are even smaller. The danger of those objects is that actually they fly with such a high speed that they, if they hit ISS or another part, they can make holes or even destroy equipment. All these objects, 6% of them are actually active satellites. 
22 percent of them are dead satellites. So satellites which have finished their uh, mission or which are uh, have no longer power, which are defects, uh, but so they are dead. 70 percent of those objects are actually uh, parts of launchers. So when you launch a rocket to uh, put an, to orbit a satellite, of course the rocket is also flying in orbit, so it's flying uh, above us. 42% are fragments of satellites. Sometimes satellites uh, break, explode, uh, collide, or whatever, and that puts fragments of uh, satellites, which are smaller, of course, but still dangerous. And 13% uh, of the objects are called operational waste. Sometimes when you launch a satellite, you have uh, uh, protection in front of the camera or so, and once the satellite goes live, you remove this, and of course, it's still in space, so <coughs> it's part of this operational waste. Looking at the uh, object in space, if you would take a picture, uh, it would look like a very big cloud. And so you see it's very crowded. There's a lot of things, a lot of junk flying around. <coughs> One week ago, last Friday, Roscosmos, the Russian uh, space agency, detected a potential threat. So a debris from a proton launch that they launched in 1987 uh, menaced to collide the, with the ISS, <coughs> and uh, it would have approached the ISS less than 500 meters. So uh, what the Roscosmos decided is to launch, to start the engine of the ISS. Actually, the ISS don't have major thrusters, but they have a permanently at least one cargo ship docked. And the uh, cargo ship just serves as a thruster for the uh, ISS. So they started the engine, they did a 10, a 100 second burn, and they achieved to move the ISS uh, into a higher altitude of 900 meter, and to actually uh, add to the speed 0.5 meters per second. Uh, so it is not a big change of speed, but don't forget it's a 450 ton object you, you have to move and you don't have to break it. So you have to be very gentle when you start engines. So that is a simulated orbit. Uh, the white line is the orbit of the ISS, and the red line is the orbit of the uh, proton, uh, oh, uh, yeah, of the proton rocket, and it would have collided, uh, or at least approached by less than 500 meters, which is quite scary still, so uh, because it can do a lot of damage. So. That was a small introduction by me. Uh, let's go and see where the ISS is currently. So, one second, please. So, that is the current position now of the ISS. The ISS is flying just over the Northern Pacific Ocean and it will uh, fly over, continue, fly over North America uh, up to the ground station, which is located in New Hampshire. So I will just accelerate the movement and you will see at a certain stage, the ISS will see the ground station. The ground station will be able to see ISS and we will can 
uh, we can then establish a contact. The contact will last up to loss of signal, so when ISS is below horizon. You can see also Don Bosco, uh, which is completely out of the path currently of ISS. If you would want to make a direct contact, we would have to wait a lot of time to actually to be able to see it. Uh, it would be somewhere uh, this evening. It would be something like uh, 23 o'clock UTC, so one o'clock in the morning. So then that would be not very practical for all of us. So ISS is still, uh, it will appear in 11 minutes above the ground station. Uh, what we can do is I can show you that the actual circle is a true circle. It's not a, a sort of egg. And so the ISS will fly over and reach New Hampshire and fly across it and we can make the contact. So that is the uh, ISS. So uh, we still have a couple of minutes left. Uh, what can I explain more? Just go back. Stop sharing screen. Okay, so that is a short introduction to the ISS and to the contact we are doing. Uh, what will also happen is, uh, so what we establish, we have a video conference between the students and the uh, ground station. So you can see currently uh, all the cameras of the students. Uh, and uh, so uh, that is everybody who's participating can be uh, shown. Uh, you have, will have the picture of it. So that is uh, one thing. Yeah, took some time to refresh at my side, sorry for that. So the contact uh, we will do is with a station in New Hampshire. It is a radio amateur station. Uh, so it's not a station from NASA or so using uh, professional equipment. It has been built by radio amateurs and uh, one reason why we can have a radio amateur station on board is that if everybody fails, uh, if everything fails from the NASA transmission, they can always come back and call upon the radio amateur network to actually make emergency communications in case of. And it actually uh, happened that NASA lost contact with the ISS and they asked us to go uh, be standby to actually uh, listen for ISS in case of. So that is uh, the small introduction. We have now eight minutes left for the uh, before the contact. So let's uh, start in a few, in one minute, we start with the official part of the contact. So, okay, so what we did this morning, uh, before we did some sound checks. So everybody, everybody is 
uh, loud and clear. And uh, it will be then uh, the contact will is now planned in seven minutes. So let's start with it. Uh, this is now the official part. So hello, hello everyone. This is Stefan Dombrovsky, ON6TI, your amateur radio moderator for today. Through the help of amateur radio volunteers and the crew on the ISS, we hope soon to establish ham radio contact with the International Space Station as it flies more than 400 kilometers above Earth. This is all accomplished with ARIS, amateur radio on the International Space Station. The ISS currently is flying over the Pacific Ocean at a speed of 28,000 kilometers an hour. This contact will be performed using amateur radio telemetry network a worldwide network of amateur radio ground station that enables students to contact the ISS. IRIS is a consortium of ham radio volunteers from nine nations that develop and operate the amateur radio station on board the ISS. Some members of IRIS are the Royal Union of Belgian Amateurs, the worldwide AMSAT radio amateur corporations, CSA, that's the Canadian Space Agency, ESA, JAXA, which is the Japanese Space Agency, NASA, and Roscosmos. The amateur radio ground station that will establish contact with the ISS is AB10C, located in Holland, New Hampshire, and operated by FRED. Thank you for helping us out, Fred. We have about five minutes until contact time. Our contact for today is with Chris Cassidy, KF5KDR, the HAM radio contact coordinator for today is ON6TI. Today, we have students from Don Bosco School in Hart, Belgium. We have asked the principal, Mr. Lindknecht, to briefly tell us about the school and the students taking part today. Mr. Lindknecht. Yes, hello. Hello, I'm Gerd Lindknecht, principal of the school. Don Bosco Haag is a secondary school with about 2,500 pupils. The location is 15 miles off Brussels. Our school, founded in 1961, offers a wide spectrum of education areas working to academic, technical, and vocational qualifications. Besides, there are offered many opportunities to be involved in international activities such as sport competitions, STEM projects, and an exchange project with an Indian sister school in Pondicherry. Over. Okay. Today is a very special contact. Indeed, all students are at home using an audio and video conference over internet to reach the ground station. This is a world first. The ISS currently has already started to fly over uh, Northern America. So that is the current position and it will continue flying over towards the ground station. So maybe you want to see before the contact begins, please tell us about your ham radio station, where you are and how you will handle the conversation. Okay, thank you, Stefan. Hello, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our contact today. Um, and a special thanks to all the students in the school who made all of this possible with the ISS for everybody. 
My name is Fred. My amateur radio call sign is AB10C. I'm located in Hollis, New Hampshire, about 50 clicks north of Boston, Massachusetts. The station here is a fully con computer controlled automated station that will track the ISS and follow it as we make our contact with Chris this morning. Amateur radio is a great hobby to learn about engineering, science, math, and technology in general. And uh, we hope that uh, everyone uh, watching will uh, and participating will at some point in their life take advantage of amateur radio. Students, um, good luck with your contact. And remember to say over when you're done asking your question to speak slowly and clearly so that the uh, Chris on board the ISS can hear you and answer your questions. Good luck with your contact. Thank you, Fred. Remember that what we, what we are doing on the ISS is an experiment. So we can never tell the result, positive or negative, until the experiment is over. And students, don't forget to say over. So in slightly more than one minute, the International Space Station should come over. So Fred, it's all yours. Good luck. All right, thanks everybody. We have 50 seconds till the ISS comes over the horizon today. I'm gonna to go ahead and open uh, the radio for a second so you can hear the uh, downlink static. And uh, once we acquire Chris, I'll remove the static so that we can listen comfortably to the contact. Okay, uh, that's what I'm hearing here in New Hampshire. We have 25 seconds till the contact. The antennas are beginning to track in on the ISS. Fifteen seconds. November Alpha One Sierra Sierra. November Alpha One Sierra Sierra. Any copy on Alpha Bravo One Oscar Charlie? Alpha Bravo One Oscar Charlie. This is November Alpha One Sierra Sierra. Over. November Alpha One Sierra Sierra AB 10 c Hello, Chris. All the students are excited to hear your voice. Thank you so much for taking your precious time to make contact with us. Are you ready for the students' questions? Over. Good morning. Great to be with you. Yes, uh, ready for the questions. Over. Okay, students. Good luck. It's all yours. Uh, students, go ahead and start with your questions. So, a uh, question for Siba. How can you tell time? Does day and night exist in the space station? Over. Great question. We uh, set Greenwich Mean Time on our watches. That's the time in London. And uh, that's how we live our daily lives. Even though we pass uh, around the world 16 times a day, uh, we look out the window, we see day. We look out the window, we see night. But what really drives our schedule is uh, a, just a normal work day with uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that's how uh, we live our day, day and night. Over. Hello, I'm Dennis. What are the difficulties in space in putting clothes on? Over. Unfortunately, I'm not hearing your questions. Over. Can you hear me? Uh, 
And there's a Oscar question. I'm unable to hear the question, so I'll pass in the blinds. I have the list of the questions. For the next one from Dennis. What are the difficulties in putting uh, clothes on in space? It's actually not difficult at all. You just uh, uh, float right into your pants, put your shirt on the same way. The, the most challenging item to put on are your socks. Oh, uh, over. Quinton? Chris, do you have us now? I have you live there now. Go ahead, over. Okay, next student, ask your question. Nice to meet you. I'm Quinton. Why would you go outside of the ISS, and how many of you can leave at the same time? Over. We go outside of the ISS, we call that an EVA, or a spacewalk, to uh, repair broken equipment, or install new equipment, or to install an experiment. And uh, two of us can leave at a time, and although during the space shuttle era, uh, they did do a three-person EVA at one point, but normally it's always two. We have a buddy. And uh, uh, it's an all-day event. In fact, Paul Duncan and I have a uh, spacewalk next week. Over. Hi, I'm Peace. What anthropogenic influences or man-made structures on Earth can you observe from space? Over. We well, make it difficult to uh, see any man-made structures uh, on a, with a with a nice little photo lens on our camera. We can make out. Uh, cities and which really mag magnified, we can uh, zoom in on, on the man made structures that are large, like um, arena, sports arenas and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. It is possible to see um, uh, other large things like a, a dam, a huge dam, because uh, you can find the lake. But man made structures are very difficult to see from space. Over. Hello, I'm Renske. Are you allowed to go back to Earth immediately in case of a family-related emergency? Over. Oh, that's a great question. Um, we technically it's possible to immediately return to Earth, but it would be a, a big a big deal. So if it's a family emergency, we probably wouldn't go. The only reason we would leave unexpectedly here, I think, is if our, our a medical problem with a crew member on board the space station and they needed urgent care that could only be had uh, on Earth. Over. Hi, I'm Jana. Is it possible to drink sparkling water on board of the ISS? Over. It is possible to drink sparkling water on board the ISS, although we don't have it. Uh, the bubbles don't stay very long. Uh, so all of the water we have is still water. And all of the uh, well, all of the beverages we have, you add the water to to make the beverage. So we don't have anything or with bubbles or sparkling on board the space station. Over. Hello, Chris. I'm Hanna. What kind of experiments do you do in space, and do they sometimes include animals? Over. Uh, we do lots of experiments, and um, many of them are biological experiments, as you're suggesting with animals and. Um, we have mice up here occasionally. We've had frogs and insects and, and fish even, uh, spiders. Uh, and that's all we've had on the space station that I can think of. But we are doing experiments on, uh, uh, in fact, one I'm doing, working on right now is a, with foam to de determine uh, manufacturing techniques that it could be better in space for foam. Over. Hi, I'm Paul. Why would the ISS change its course and how fast does it do that? Over. We change our course on the ISS uh, occasionally to avoid orbital debris. In fact, we did, did this maneuver just uh, last week to uh, avoid a possible collision with, with some space debris. And it's not so much of uh, changing our course. Our course is relatively, well, is definitely fixed on a bearing of 51.6 degrees. Uh, but the altitude we can adjust, and we do that with an, our engine, and we can uh, uh, fire that within a two-hour notice. Over. Hello, I'm Antoine. Have you ever had any problems with oxygen, pressure, or fire on board, and how can you solve such problems? Over. I'm not hearing the questions, but I know that Anton has one. Have you ever had any problems with oxygen, pressure, or fire on board, and how do you solve such problems? We train extensively for these types of situations, 
fortunately, since I've been on board of my two missions, we have not yet had a, a problem with oxygen or pressure or fire. Although uh, about a year and a half ago, they did have a slow leak where uh, an unknown, for an unknown reason, there was a small uh, uh, amount of ga air leaving the International Space Station. They found it and plugged the hole, and everything was okay. Over. Hi, Chris. I'm Carl. What do you do when you have free time? Over. Carl, oh, with our free time, we like to do things that you can only do up here. And mostly that involves looking out the window and taking pictures of Earth. Although we do have um, movies and books, electronic books, a few real physical books, mostly electronic. There's musical instruments. And, um, and of course, we sit and talk and laugh uh, with each other. Uh, that's another thing we do in our free time. Over. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, I am Londre. How did it feel when you took off? Over. When, uh, when you take off, you have lots of emotions, excitement, uh, joy, happiness, pride. A little bit of, uh, of uh, fear is a good thing because that means you respect the situation that you're in and, and what's happening underneath you. Um, but mostly it's just you're very uh, excited to get to the point where all this training is finally coming to a point where you can use it and it's time for the mission to start over. This is so, a question uh, for Siba. Um, how do the quality and duration of your sleep in the ISS differ from what you are used to on Earth? Over. From what you're used to on Earth. So let's let's give a big round of applause to uh, Chris if he can still hear us. Chris, any thank you. Right. Yeah, yes, uh, you, you all did a wonderful job, and um, um, I want to thank you all for uh, for making our contact possible this morning. This is AB10C. I'm clear of the frequency. Okay, thank you, uh, Fred. So, uh, as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, we have shared a moment of history. Amateur radio station AB10C in Hollis, New Hampshire, operated by Fred contacted Chris Cassidy, K5KDR, on board of the International Space Station, <coughs> talking with students in Belgium. Luc, do you have anything you would like to add? No, I just wanted to thank everybody for the very nice collaboration, and uh, especially Fred. Thanks a lot. It went very, very well. Thank you. Thank you for being allowing me to be part of a, a special experience with all of you today. Okay, now for the international volunteer team of ARIS, including the Royal Union of Belgian Archers, Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation around the world, CSA, ESA, JAXA, and NASA, and Roscosmos, this is Stefan Dombrowski, amateur operator ON6TI, sending my greetings to all of you in amateur radio terms 73. Best wishes. 73, everybody. <clears throat> so thank you for everybody. Um, so that was a very uh, good contact. Uh, we had some small issues, but that can happen. Um, Luke, uh, is uh, the press coming? Well, I don't think so. I don't see anybody uh, appearing, so uh, I don't think uh, I had a phone call during the uh, the uh, the call. I think they are recording it, and I don't think they will 
pop up in the in the conference call here, Stefan. Okay, so uh, thank you to everybody. A uh, special thanks to Fred, AB1OC, for his ground station. Uh, thank you for Bertus to be my backup. Uh, thank you for Nick for the streaming to the internet and for Jasper replacing Sieber uh, because of some technical issues with his microphone. Uh, thank you to all of you students because you actually achieved something which is probably unique in your lifetime. Uh, so I hope you will remember it and uh, is, uh, that it stimulates your life in the future. Uh, so many thanks. Many thanks also to all the other people around, uh, Jan in his background, Gaston, uh, and also to the other teachers, Caroline, Jasper, uh, Nick and Luc uh, for helping to organize all this. Thank you, Stefan. And a special thanks to Meneer Leenknecht as well for making this possible on uh, this school. Yes, from my side, <laughs> congratulations, Stefan, for the very well preparations and especially Jasper and uh, Fred, who did an extensive job to get this done. And all the <coughs> students, very nice to see you. And to, I'm glad to be part of this uh, experiment. Over to you, Stefan. As and from Gaston also, all my congratulations on the, this uh, feat and uh, thank to Fred and also to the students of course and uh, principally to Stefan for his guidance and leadership in this event. Thank you so much and see you later. Bye bye. Okay, thank you. Bye. Uh, yes, yeah, Stefan again, a, a big, big, big thanks and it was uh, very well organized, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> Nick, I think you can stop the streaming uh, if you haven't done that so far. <clears throat>